Welcome everyone to this town hall discussion on critical race theory that's sponsored by New Detroit in partnership with Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance. I'm really glad that uh, everyone has, uh, has joined us. We're gonna have a really interesting conversation uh, this evening, uh, not only with some distinguished panelists, but with you, uh, those who have tuned in to, uh, to, to chat with us about this. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna say something really quick about the idea of this, the idea of people coming together to talk about critical race theory. I remember back in 1990, picking up a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well uh, by a distinguished professor named Derek Bell, reading in that book about the idea of critical race theory, and then not hearing much about it um, for a really long time. I think it's important and critical to note that this has resurfaced as part of the narrative in our country about inequality and fairness. Uh, and we may not like all of the things that are being said about critical race theory. We may not like all of the things that are being said about the idea of surfacing and fronting discussion about this kind of equality. But it's key and it's terribly important that we are talking about it. Imagine. Uh, how significant that is, the number of people who had never heard of critical race theory, who now know at least a little bit about what it is, uh, whether they like it or support it or don't. Um, we got to take progress where we can. It comes in increments, uh, often not large steps. It is progress that we are having this discussion, and it is huge progress that New Detroit and Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance uh, have decided to have this town hall. So uh, I'm really glad you've all joined us. I think uh, all of us will enjoy this experience, hopefully learn a lot, uh, and go on with the discussions uh, that are taking place all over the country, really, uh, about what this means, how important it is, and how we move to a better place uh, as Americans. Uh, I want to introduce uh, the two uh, folks who are most responsible for putting all of this together. Uh, today, Mike Rafferty is president and CEO of New Detroit Inc. And Gloria Lara is the executive director of Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance. Uh, you guys, uh, welcome to the town hall. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's great to see you again. Uh, and hello, everyone. Um, echoing what Stephen said, thank you so much for being here. Um, and again, I'm Mike Rafferty, uh, and I have the pleasure of being president and CEO of New Detroit. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a racial justice organization uh, founded in response to Detroit's 1967 rebellion. Uh, and we exist today to achieve racial understanding and racial equity in Southeast Michigan. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you as, as Stephen is, um, as we discuss uh, one of the most hotly debated topics in the country uh, related to our work. Uh, and I'm also pleased to have partnered with uh, uh, not only an ally, but a really strong colleague in, in the state, Gloria Laura, and her team at Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance to bring us here tonight. Um, I hope you all enjoy and are inspired by today's conversation. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. And it is a pleasure to be joining with you to do this, this joint town hall across the state of Michigan. There are many uh, attendees from the state of Michigan. There's also attendees from around the country as well. And I'm gonna do a call out because I don't know if she's on, but there is a call out, someone from my hometown of Pico Rivera, California. I'm really mm -hmm. excited about that. Um, Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance, we call ourselves LIDA, was founded 25 years ago in, by the community in Grand Haven in response to racist incidents for a black family in Grand Haven. Uh, graffiti was sprayed on their sidewalk, racist graffiti, and they decided to pack up and they moved back to the Detroit area. So ever since then, we have been focusing on uh, building bridges between different parts of the communities. We're mainly in Western Michigan, in Ottawa County, and going into Muskegon County, uh, Kent County, and Elegant County, but now we're also expanding uh, our services, which are mainly workshops on implicit bias and uh, specifically tailored for the organization, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit organization or associations. We have an annual summit. Uh, well, it's live. We have over 700 people attend 
uh, summit in uh, generally it's either at Hope College or at Grand Valley State University, um, where we have keynote speakers, uh, nationally known speakers and workshops. Uh, we've been doing them virtually the past two years and everyone will be glad to know that we will be uh, having that uh, in person next year, but it will also have a virtual component for those of you that can't attend uh, in person. And the thing that we're really, really proud of is our program for middle and high school students. It's Calling All Colors, it's the name of it, where uh, cohorts of students from middle and high schools come together, they have their own mini conference, and then they go off to their schools and do their projects as well as do curriculum. One of the reasons we're really proud of it, we've been doing this for 20 years, is we are now in our second generation of students. And the reason I say that is some of the teachers and mentors for the students now went to Calling All Colors when they were in high school. So think about the participation and the long-term effects of having programs like this as we move forward. And I'm really pleased that one of our panelists, Haley, is what has been a part, uh, mentor in Calling All Colors. And so she can give you the, what I would call the boots on the ground feel for that. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks very much, Mike and Gloria for organizing today's town hall and for uh, greeting all of our, all of our participants. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Stephen. We're going to. Okay, so we're going to get started, uh, and I am going to welcome, first welcome our guests. But before I do that, I want to note that we really want to have this conversation with those of you who are participating uh, in the town hall. And the way for you to become part of the conversation uh, is through a little button on the bottom of your Zoom window that says Q&A. If you have a question, if you have an issue that you want us to discuss, uh, just go and click on that and you can type, um, you can type into uh, that, uh, you can type into that box any questions you have. If you're watching on Facebook, you can of course uh, type questions uh, into Facebook uh, where you're watching uh, the town hall. And uh, after I have a brief conversation with our panelists, uh, we will get to uh, you, the participants, and, and hear what you think uh, about all of this. Okay, so let me introduce our panel tonight. We've got some really interesting and distinguished guests. First is Dr. Rashan Ray. He is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, also a professor of sociology and executive director for the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland at College Park. Dr. Ray, welcome to the town hall. Thank you for having me. Uh, also with us is Dr. Truman Hudson Jr., who is an outreach coordinator, instructor, and multiculturalism teacher for the Education Division in the College of Education at Wayne State University. Uh, Dr. Hudson, welcome to the Town Hall. Thank you, looking forward to the conversation. Also with us is Mary Jane Evink. Uh, she is, has been the Executive Director of Instructional Services for Grand Haven, Grand Haven Public Schools since uh, 2013. She's the chairperson of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee and serves on the Anti-Racism Task Force through the Momentum Center in Grand Haven. Mary Jane, uh, welcome to the town hall. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. And also with us is Haley Beanie Barton. She is a special education teacher at Grand Haven High School. She's also the liaison to her school's chapter of the Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance's Calling All Colors program and was a core member of the district's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. Haley Barton, welcome to the town hall as well. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. Okay, so Dr. Ray, I am gonna talk, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I would love to have you talk about what you think um, critical race theory is in the context of the conversation that we are having in America right now. I don't, I don't want you to give us the formal definition of it necessarily, because uh, I think that's a little 
uh, esoteric and is actually pretty removed from most of our lives, unless you're a lawyer. Uh, it's not something you're ever really going to be taught about. But what does that mean when we use that term, uh, when we talk about equity, inclusion, uh, inequality, fairness uh, in America? And why is it important uh, to be part of this reckoning, I guess, that you might uh, say that we have been having for about the last year, uh, as, as I think a lot of people are reconsidering the way they think about America and equality? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great question. And obviously, I think that's, that's the thousand dollar question in terms of how we think about it. The first thing is it's important, as you noted, to put it in a, in, in a proper context for what's happening today. We know that over the summer, that Fox News mentioned critical race theory nearly 1,000 times for a series of months. Uh, we actually tracked this in a Brookings report. And what we found in our analysis is that critical race theory, as you noted, became quite removed from the actual definition and conceptualization of it, which I'll, I'll briefly explain in a second. But what's important to note is that critical race theory became a flashpoint and what we called a boogeyman for anything related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's what's important for people to note. And I'll say something about that in a second. And so part of thinking about this is when we think about what critical race theory is and what it's not, well, first off, a lot of opponents of critical race theory fear that it actually admonishes all white people for being oppressors while classifying all black people as hopelessly oppressed victims, um, neither of which are true. Uh, these, these fears have spurred school boards and state legislatures from my great state of Tennessee to all the way places out west like Idaho to ban teachings about racism and also sexism and homophobia in the classroom. And that's what's important for people to note is our analysis of legislations across the country shows that critical race theory and the way that critical race theory has captured diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives has extended well beyond how we might think about race or racism in the classroom. There's one fundamental problem. These narratives about critical race theory are gross exaggerations of the theoretical framework. The broad brush that is being applied to critical race theory is puzzling to academics like myself, including some of the scholars who actually coined and originally started employing the term. Critical race theory does not attribute racism to white people as individuals or even to entire groups of people. Simply put, critical race theory states that US social institutions, the criminal justice system, the education system, the labor market, housing, healthcare, that these social institutions are laced with racism that is embedded in our laws, our rules, our regulations and procedures that lead to differential outcomes by race. When it comes to the criminal justice system, I think we simply have to look at the current court cases from, uh, from what's happening in Minnesota to what's happening down in Georgia and Virginia in between to actually see the way this plays out in one key outcome such as jury selection and another outcome such as judge judges uh, discretion as well as uh, lawyer discretion in terms of peremptory strikes. Sociologists and other scholars have long noted that racism can exist without races. However, many Americans are not able to separate their individual identity as an American from the social institutions that govern us. See, that is a very, very key point. These people perceive themselves as the system. Consequently, they interpret calling social institutions racist as calling them racist personally. It speaks to how normative racial ideology is to American identity that some people can simply, simply can't separate these two things, their individual identity from social institutions. It also speaks to how overly simplistically we view racism, that oftentimes people think racism only operates on what we call a micro level, face-to-face -face interactions. Instead, racism also operates through social institutions. And that's part of what critical race theory is aiming to highlight. There are also people who may recognize America's racist past but have actually bought into the false narrative that the United States is now an equitable democracy. They are simply unwilling to remove the blind spots and co a colorblind ideology that oftentimes obscures the fact that America is not great for everyone. Now, my, my last point here, as we, as we set this context, is that scholars and activists who discuss critical race theory are not arguing 
that white people living now are to blame for what people did in the past. That is another big narrative. But what we are saying is that people living now, white people and others, have a moral responsibility to do something about how racism still impacts all of our lives today. Policies attempting to suffocate this much needed national conversation are actually obstacles to the pursuit of an equitable democracy. And I think that becomes the key point is to put this in a broader context that when we analyze these policies, these legislations across the country, many of them do not even mention the words critical race theory. Instead, they become catch-alls for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that is what should scare us all. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about um, uh, the idea of uh, seeing the world this way, and, and, and I, like to, I like to kind of frame the idea of critical race theory really as a lens, a lens for understanding the past, a lens for seeing uh, what, what happens now and a lens for understanding uh, what outcomes are. Um, but when we talk about the idea of, of doing that, the pushback uh, that we hear, I think a lot of times is race doesn't explain everything in America. Race doesn't have an effect on every disparate outcome that we see uh, between blacks and whites. Uh, or between others in our society, uh, Dr. Ray, how do you how do you answer that? It, even those who accept that the idea that this is a lens through which to see all of these things, they're saying this just isn't so. This is a false lens for understanding America. You know, it's always interesting to me. It's it's similar to how we talk about sexism. So so let's take the gender gap in pay, which for for many people they take that for granted. They take that as an assumption, as, as something that's normative. And research documents that if we keep letting things go on as normal, that women will finally get paid what men get paid in the year 2050. I don't know about everyone else, but waiting another 29 years just doesn't seem like something we should do. And simply saying that women have made some progress in the labor market and suggesting that then that is an excuse to act as if gender still doesn't hinder their lives is similar to people who say, well, maybe race matters a little bit, but not as much as it used to. Part of the problem there is that any time a form of difference, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, ability, is used as a hindrance for someone, additional hurdles for people to step over, those are things that we should operate to address. The other thing is that I also think a lot of people think that progress is linear. In other words, that if we've made progress in the, fa in the past, that it will simply continue. That is not how equality works. Instead, we actually have to double down on it. We have to ensure that our policies are equitable because or else the same way that things have moved forward, they can reverse back. For example, schools today are basically just as segregated, if not more segregated than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Why is that? That is because now a lot of school funding is primarily driven by local property taxes. We know that those local property taxes are rooted in home ownership. We know that if you live in a predominantly black or Latino or low income neighborhood, that you're less likely to get value out of your home. Therefore, your school is then less likely to get money. But what does the United States promise people in equitable education? So, so just in that juncture, that's an example. No one has done anything directly. And of course, we could talk about appraisals for homes and those sort of things. But overall, the point here is that if racism or any form of difference in inequality matters in people's lives, those are things that we should work to do away with. And simply highlighting the successes of a few, whether that be a few Black people, a few Latino people, Asian people, women, even when we talk about gender, that those individuals cannot simply become tokenized visions of success. And instead, we have to look at what's happening at the median and the mean. And that's where we see rising forms of inequality, not just in education, but in housing, in the labor market, and definitely in the criminal justice system and healthcare. And we just saw that with COVID-19. Okay, uh, Dr. Truman Hudson, I wanna turn to you. Um, you know, as an outreach coordinator and instructor in the teacher education division at Wayne State, you're looking at uh, youth perspectives on COVID, on social justice movements, and ways in which to increase equity in, in education. Education 
is, I think, the frontier where this argument is, is taking place right now. Uh, there are a lot of people who are afraid that, uh, that education will be changed in, in a way to, to reflect critical race theory. There are people who are saying that education right now reflects way too much uh, critical race theory and that some of the things that are being taught, not just to, to college kids, but to kids in K-12, uh, reflect this perspective. I wonder, as an educator, if you can talk about what actually goes on uh, in classrooms and, and in schools, uh, but, but also uh, why critical race theory and applying more critical race theory to the educational context is not uh, the threat that, that perhaps a lot of people believe it to be. Uh, let's start from the beginning, 529 years ago when Columbus uh, and the Spaniards uh, came to the indigenous lands of what we now call the Americas. Uh, there was this so-called exploration, which led to the exploitation of a group of people, which is the framework upon which we are looking at critical race theory and looking at people who were uh, actually put in positions of subjugation of less than in order for someone else to profit or gain. Uh, that's 529 years ago. 402 years ago, when the U.S. started as a quote-unquote nation, uh, and when we look at the, uh, the framing of the Constitution and we look at the preamble, it starts out with the false narrative of we the people. Uh, it starts out, we the people in the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice and endure domestic tranquility, provide the common defense, promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings and liberty to ourselves and our posterities, do ordain to establish the Constitution of the United States of America. I want you to think about who were the people? And in the case of establishing this nation, this nation was established by land only white males. So in establishing this framework of critical race theory, it's, it's important to understand that if you were a, a poor white male, you didn't have a voice, you did not have access to voting. If you were enslaved in this country, you did not have a voice. If you were a woman, you did not have a voice. So this country was grown and developed based on this framework that comes out of the Constitution. And then when we think about to ourselves and our posterity, posterity referencing to long-term, the people who are tied to our lineage. So going back to looking at the laws, the laws that frame, the, frame how we operate in this country are all guided by the Constitution of the United States. I also want to bring out the fact that when we think about education, uh, it's, it's important for us to give consideration to the fact that a lot of the books that our young people are reading are not reflective of the diverse personalities that actually represent this country and what we are. And when we think about 529, 402, and 232, 232 years ago, uh, when we think about when we became a nation, the it took us 232 years for us to get our first Black male president, something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. We have our first Black female uh, vice president. And in our nation's history, we've only had three people of color to ascend to the, to the branch of uh, the judicial branch of the Supreme Court in our, in our country. Those are key for young people to understand when we start to unpack legislation and how legislation inform who they are. So going back to education, the common core standards for history and social studies for grades six through 12, which are a set of goals and expectations that are put in place where young people are empowered to investigate people places and historical events, they are empowered to gather evidence from primary documents and construct their own knowledge of the past based on their findings. And I'm, I'm framing it through that lens to say, we're not in a space in America where we're fully embracing that young people have voice and they're in a position where they can articulate through research that's guided by an instructor or an educator to help them better understand how these laws, how these people, places, and historical events have truly informed the type of education that they're receiving. Uh, based on our research and working with young people through the Your Explore program at Wayne State University, what we found that over the past two years is that the inequities that are truly underreported for our, our rural communities, which are consistent with what we've been seeing in our urban communities are kind of like brushed up under the rug because nobody in the nation really wants to pay attention to the fact that the digital divide that we've been talking about for years is still a, a, a relevant concern 
for not just young people in our traditionally underrepresented communities, but young people across the board. So when we look at critical race theory, going back to looking at students based on gender identification, based on a, a specific class that they are connected to, or more specifically, a specific cultural disposition, there's a lack of resources to, tru to truly support how they advance through the educational system. It's not their fault, but if they're given an opportunity to actually investigate things that are tied to the economic systems in this country, I think they'll be able to potentially give us solutions. When you think about the US Department of Education, uh, I think the last budget was $734.2 uh, billion. The Federal Election Commission, $70.5 billion. The Department of Justice, $41.7 billion. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, $68.4 billion were appropriated to those departments to wrestle with the same issues that we've been dealing with since the forming of this country. So when we look at moving from the, the Constitution to the Emancipation Proclamation, Civil Rights Act of 1866, then we got into the Jim Crow era throughout this entire experience people were put in the position where there were restrictive covenants that prevented them from actually ac accessing housing. And there were also laws that prevented individuals from accessing equitable opportunities in employment. So for to put a young person in a position today where they can investigate those things and potentially unpack solutions is important because they're not only the future, they are the now. So, so when you think about what goes on in schools now and on college campuses like, like Wayne State, how close or how far are we from asking uh, students to, to tune to these kind of things, to, to have this kind of inquiry, to think of things uh, in this framework? If you watch Fox News, uh, you would believe that it's everywhere, it's all the time. Um, somehow I suspect that if I walked into a classroom on your campus, uh, I, might not, I might not see that reflected quite the way they're, they're saying it. Stephen, we missed an opportunity when the pandemic occurred. Um, I had a loft over in Midtown and I remember when uh, Mr. George Floyd was killed and I remember watching marching, young people marching down Woodward Avenue from the boulevard going all the way to downtown of multicultural backgrounds with a strong voice around the issues that influenced them at that time. And what we've not done is taken an opportunity to go back and retool and identify a new way in which we can teach. We're still trying to teach the way you and I went to school. We're still trying to teach the way uh, Dr. Ray and I went to school. It's like, these young people are not there anymore. They're in a new space where they're challenging the narrative, because they have access to so much information. But what we're doing is we're pigeonholing them to uh, this old ideology and this deficit framework that they don't know what it takes in order to advance this economic and educational agenda that we so-called purport is supposed to lead us into this space where we can so-called equalize this system. So I believe that we are we have some people who are committed to the work, uh, not just at Wayne State, but throughout the country. We have people in our PK-12 uh, uh, school system, whether they be public, charter, or private, who believe in the young people. But the unfortunate part is they're pigeonholed to, uh, the, to people's ideologies that if one person advances, then another person can't. And if they advance, then that puts me in a position where I can't be as successful because it's me versus them. And it really should be we the people. So we've not gotten back to we the people. But if we take the position where we give young people a true civics course, and a true civics course is really understanding all sides of the conversation and allowing them to identify what the issues are and potential solutions, we can go far. I mean, the fact that we're even having this conversation right now, I believe that um, we all got educated in some form or fashion. So this shows the power of education, right? So if we can just build off of our narrow lens that education worked for us, then we can empower young people and get them connected to some of the things that you're doing at the radio station or some of the things that you're doing on TV so they can exercise their voice. And I think my last part that I just really want to drive home is that... Um, when we looked at the, 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 
the, the narrative that was developed during the pandemic, the unfortunate part, most of the voices that we heard were not the young people. The majority of the voices when it came to education and they are the benefit benefactors of this product, the majority of the voices that we heard from were the people who were in leadership, whether it be on the federal level, the state level, the local level, or inside of that specific school district. But nobody asked the young people, how do you learn? How do you learn best? Nobody truly asked and listened to the young people on how do we right size this situation to ensure that all students learn and how do we create a situation where we can uh, develop individual educational plans for all students. Well, that's too costly, right? Because if we create an educational plan to teach to all students where they are, it's gonna cost us more money, but it's costing us more money now when we look at the dollars that we put into the justice system. It's costing us more money now when we think about unemployment because all of those indicators that Dr. Ray suggested are all tied to education. So if our young people are undereducated because we're not speaking to them in the 21st century, then they can't be as successful and we'll continue to repeat the lessons that we that started 529 years ago. Okay, I wanna remind all of our participants that if you wanna participate in this conversation, you will have a question, uh, or a comment, uh, there are two ways you can, uh, you can do that. One is if you're watching on Facebook, of course, you can post those questions there. Uh, but you can also hit the little Q&A button on your Zoom if you're watching on Zoom uh, and type uh, questions in there. And uh, after I'm done uh, interrogating our panelists, uh, I, will let, uh, I will let our participants ask, uh, ask some questions. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Hudson, for, for uh, that great primer on, on what's going on. Stephen, excuse me, can someone turn on the closed captioning? Because uh, we've gotten a, someone posted several times about closed captioning, and we need to make sure that we can uh, get our brothers and sisters who can't hear to participate in this conversation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I hope that the, uh, the organizers are watching that chat and seeing those questions too and have been able to uh, to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, Excuse me, we are trying to get the closed captioning on in the Zoom, but somehow it doesn't seem to be uh, working for us right now. We have heard that the closed captioning is working on the Facebook Live uh, feeds. So that uh, is the uh, option that you can use. Okay, good information. And uh, thank you, uh, Gloria. Okay, right, I want to move now to the K-12 context and talk a little about what all this looks like in actual classrooms here in the state of Michigan. Uh, Mary Jane Evink, I'm going to start with you. You uh, are the Executive Director of Instructional Services for the Grand Haven Public Schools. Um, uh, you're also the Chairperson of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging committee and you serve on the anti-racism task force through the Momentum Center in Grand Haven. So for those of us who don't know about uh, Grand Haven and maybe never have been there, tell us a little bit about it uh, and then tell us about the way in which the debate about critical race theory is playing out in schools like those in the Grand Haven uh, School District. Even thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really happy to be in this learning space with everybody and I'm continuing to learn by no means and I am I an expert, but I do believe passionately that education is the golden ticket and I stand strongly for justice, inclusion and belonging. I grew up in Grand Haven, Michigan and I returned here to work and live and it's primarily a white community. Our school district, uh, the employees are 90% white, um, about 13% non-white students. So the staff ratio and student ratio that we employ there um, isn't, we're not where we wanna be yet. But I think more importantly, um, one of my experiences, my personal experiences was when I left Grand Haven to go to school. Um, I discovered that the world doesn't look like Grand Haven, Michigan and it was uncomfortable. And I became resentful to my community that they hadn't prepared me to have the conversations and to talk with others like everyone else seemed to have those skills. 
So when I returned to teach American history, I thought this is my chance. We need to start talking about race. Um, that hunch was confirmed. Uh, Dr. Sean Harper spoke to our teachers in our community in 2015. And the title of his lecture was Seven Things White Kids Need to Know About Race. And at the top of his list was, you have to talk about race because it unites people, it helps create understanding, it authenticates, and it's a problem solving tool. I think it's important to note that our teachers self-identified that they wanted help talking about race, becoming more skillful and brave talking about race. So we are focused on some professional development where we can be part of the national conversation. It's happening. And if we don't do it in our school system, when our students are asking for it, it's malpractice. So um, we're, we're trying, we're giving each other grace and we're, we're letting our students know that when they have questions, um, we're gonna do our best to, to bring race into the conversation in the most authentic way that we know how, knowing that we're, we'll only get better through practice. So, so uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I wanted to mention that when, I'd never heard of critical race theory until eight months ago. And I had to do a, a small amount of studying to figure out what it was and to see if we were doing it because I wanted to answer the public honestly. And um, it became quite clear that, you know, this is a complex study. It happens in universities. Um, we are not equipped to study critical race theory. Um, it's about institutions. It's not about individuals. And um, additionally, when people ask, I point to the fact that something like critical race theory takes a significant amount of planning to implement. We have no documentation um, for meaningful preparation of critical race theory. We have no launch of it. We have no budget or funding for critical race theory, and it's not in our school improvement plans. So I do share that and it answers some questions for some people, but what's most concerning for me is that the mislabeling of critical race theory is causing quite a bit of confusion. And this confusion is, makes me worry that people are concerned about us teaching history or about, about us talking about race. And those are things that are absolutely essential to our curriculum and the shaping of our young people and the perpetuation of our Republic. We need to have talk about history so that this free and public education can perpetuate and hopefully improve itself. So I'm very concerned when people mislabel CRT for the teaching of history, um, because I, I hope that we're not disagreeing that we need to learn about history. And, and I'll have one more thing to add. History's hard. It's really hard. There are some terrible as well as wonderful things that happen in history. Um, and if we're gonna be proud of the great things, then we also have to accept the responsibility of the things that weren't so great. And slavery is really hard to hear about. And so is the white supremacy that goes along with teaching of slavery. And so are war and the death that goes along with war. And the civil rights movement is really painful too. But those things create empathy, not shame or blame. We don't want our students to feel guilty or shameful. We want them to feel empowered to do the next right thing and to be on the right side of history. So if somebody says that a student is feeling shame or guilt, whoa, we gotta correct that re real quick because we want our students to feel like they belong in Grand Haven High School. Even, even if you have white skin, we want you to feel like you belong at Grand Haven Area Public Schools. Um, so I'm really curious, uh, Mary Jane, about the response uh, that you've gotten since you started talking about this. You said that uh, you learned eight months ago about uh, what critical race theory was and started really looking at the curriculum there in Grand Haven and, and trying to find places uh, where it might, it might exist. Uh, but, but you also talked about this idea that even beyond critical race theory, which of course you wouldn't find in a K-12 curriculum, uh, the, the discussion of race, the discussion of history and how honest it is, how, how eager uh, a curriculum might be to, to kind of 
challenge children and their their notions of what's true and what's not and what happened uh, and what didn't. Um, you, you said that you know Grand Haven is an overwhelmingly white community and that the schools there are overwhelmingly white. I'm really wondering what their what their response was to you even even bringing this up. You know, we have a, um, a really supportive parent base and people who believe in teaching the hard history. We have the anti-racism anti -racism task force that is uh, a grassroots efforts through the Momentum Center and there's support for these things that I'm talking about. There's some, some other people who have concerns that when we talk about race, that it causes division and I, I, as often as I can, I have in-person conversations with these people and, and let them know that it is the farthest thing from our minds to cause division among people in our school system or the community. We're, we're aiming to do the opposite of that. Um, and maybe we disagree that talking about race causes racism, but I don't think it does. I think talking about race creates unity. Um, there are, there are some people that worry that we're teaching history in a way that makes people un-American. Not true, that's fraudulent. We are so proud of our country. Um, I, the, the teachers that directly teach history and government and economics um, work so hard to empower our students. And, and I give them credit today that our students take those classes electively because they feel so proud and connected to the history. Um, it, it's the hardest part is when I tell families that I agree with them. We don't want division. We don't, we wanna be proud of our country. And I, I hope that they believe me because it's true. And I hope that we can get closer together to support one another. Okay, um, I want to bring Haley Beatty Barton into the conversation uh, now. You're a special ed education teacher at Grand Haven High School, but also the liaison from your school's to your school's chapter of the Lakeshore Ethnic Diversity Alliance's Calling All Colors program and a core member of the district's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. Uh, I, I wonder what your experience has been uh, since this conversation has exploded all over the country uh, at the classroom level. Uh, what are you hearing from parents, uh, for instance, about their concerns about how children are taught, what they're taught, uh, and, the, and whether critical race theory or race consciousness in, every, in, in any way really is... Uh, uh, is somehow creeping into uh, a curriculum that maybe didn't have it before. So what much of what I've heard um, echoes a lot of what Mary Jane said, as we're, as she mentioned, we're from the same school district. And I am finding that many people are not willing to have the conversation directly with the person that probably could have the most influence on their ch children. They're going to the school board meeting and speaking, and they're, they're not reaching out to directly to teachers and asking them, at least in my experience, I, um, I teach primarily um, students with disabilities and I teach English nine and so our social skills. So I'm not teaching some of the social studies, the American history classes where maybe they are getting more of that backlash. I have had some teachers at my school district reach out to me and um, ask for some advice and how we might combat that. But I'm primarily seeing people going to our school board and mentioning much of what Mary Jane said, where they are accusing us of dividing our students and of shaming our students. And they're, they're just simply not accurate. And I really wish that they could take the time to learn a little bit more about what we are truly doing um, without just listening to this, this fear mongering that is happening um, and the internet or in other forms of media where they're talking about just CRT as that big label of anything related to race rather than digging in and finding out what we truly are doing in the classroom. And as Mary Jane said, history is hard. When, um, but when we teach history, when we he teach the truth, it's just good teaching. It's not meant to 
cause division. It's not meant to make us dislike each other or or make a child feel like they are less because of whatever their background is. In this case, primarily we're hearing um, white parents complaining about this with their for their child. And the thing that I think that's important for all of us to remember in this is we in education and parents, we all love our kids and we want what's best for them. And I think that's one of the things that's really driving this fear is people want to protect their children. That's a natural instinct and that's important, but we need to work together to come up with ways that we can become more united and learn our true purpose in how we can make this better for all students. And we, we have to talk about it. You know, we have to talk about it. Uh, one thing I like to kind of compare it to is as someone who's had a lot of car trouble in her day, um, you know, when I think about when my car breaks down, sometimes the problem's really obvious. Like I blew a tire or something like that. I can see it right away and I know how to fix that. But other times I've gotten that dreaded thing, like something's wrong and I've got to take it in to get a diagnostic test. And I find out it's a sensor that's got to get fixed. You, you have to dig into it to figure out what's wrong and how we can make things better. So I think we have to talk about race. We have to talk about, um, I know some of the other panelists have mentioned gender and things like that. Like we have to talk about these things in order to um, make that change and make things more fair, more equitable for everyone and help our kids get that uh, better education like Dr. Hudson was referencing earlier. So uh, Haley, I'm also curious uh, because you're a teacher about uh, other teachers that uh, that you work with and, and uh, may talk with about, about these issues. Uh, I wonder if you hear pushback among teachers to the idea of a more honest and, and revealing conversation about race in, in classrooms. Uh, but I also, um, I also wonder whether you feel like teachers are prepared in your district to be able to, to teach these things differently, uh, whether, they, whether they support this idea uh, or not. That's a great question. And I think there's a there's a large range. I think there are some of us who are truly passionate about having more equitable education and um, having more diversity within our curriculum, exploring, like I said, I'm an English teacher primarily, um, like exploring more diverse authors and making sure all of our kids are seen. That is so important that um, I, when I think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like my students can't learn until they have their basic needs met, whether physical and then emotional before we're gonna get to that true learning. That's so important. And I, I know I have plenty of other colleagues who feel that way. I also know, like you mentioned about, do we feel prepared? I have several colleagues that I think while maybe their, their heart is in that space, they don't feel prepared and they're scared. They're also, I mean, there are so many um, teachers around the country right now who have, who have lost their, their jobs or for various reasons related to their work in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, there was the principal in Texas who had been rapidly promoted through his district and then was recent was fired or his contract, I shouldn't say fired, but his contract wasn't renewed. So yeah, same thing, I guess. Um, so when we're talking there, like that, that's a scary position to be in because we're human too. We have families that depend on us. We, we're not living in giant mansions with a ton of, you know, excess um, monies. We are people who are, many of us are struggling for day to day. So, so that's something that on a personal level, we have to be thinking about. And there's a lot of teachers that I work with that are scared, that don't know the right thing to say. Um, and it's emotionally draining too. Like getting, we get backlash for, for everything and add this on top of that as another thing to possibly be getting backlash about. That's emotionally scary. It's hard to be vulnerable in that space. So, so there's that. Um, I also do have some colleagues or now far, former colleagues who have been very outspoken about how they don't, um, they don't agree with how we are teaching this. And the biggest thing that I'm seeing as an overall theme is again, talking about that division piece thinking that when we're talking about race, we're dividing people, that um, they want to perpetuate the idea of colorblindness, which I know um, as I was going through school, I feel like that was that was the goal. And now, um, like Maya Angelou said, when you know better, do better. And like now we know we have to acknowledge our students' experience. We have to know that like when you walk through the world as a student of color or as an LGBTQIA plus student or as someone of a 
religious minority, like your worldview is going to be different. You've had different experiences that have brought you into that desk in my classroom. And we have to see that in order to teach you and meet your needs. Talking again about how Dr. Dr. Hudson was mentioning that, that more individualized education, we have to see our kids that way in order to help them be successful. But, um, but we still have people who um, are kind of misquoting Dr. King. And when we talk about like the content of our character that we should be judged that way. Well, yes, of course we want to judge everyone by the content of their character, but people are so much more complex than that. We have to acknowledge um, who they, who they are beyond just that. Like there's a lot that's come into building that character. And so, uh, so those are kind of, I almost think like there's three camps there. I think there are, there are teachers who are, who are ready to go, who are taking the efforts to become more educated on this because um, I've been a teacher for 12 years. And so I'd like to think that my education was relatively recent, that that wasn't that long ago, but even then um, I don't feel like teacher programs were preparing me for, for, to have this conversation. Um, this wasn't my focus in school. So I, I think a lot of us feel like in our teacher preparedness programs um, that we've been through. And I mean, I'm kind of in the middle camp on the youngish end still um, of teachers. So there's people who it's been even longer um, that they've been out and we don't feel like we've been prepared. Um, as uh, Mary Jane mentioned, our teachers are asking for that professional development. Like we want to become more competent in this, but um, but don't necessarily have the tools. So, so there's the gung-ho ready to go teachers who are taking the time to get educated. There are those who are hesitant and scared. And, and honestly, rightfully so, when you have so much personally on the line, that's, that's really difficult. I think we have to challenge ourselves to be um, co-conspirators in this fight and to work hard to, to change the system. But at the same time, you know, when you've got, you know, your three kids at home that you have to feed at the end of the day, that's, that's a hard thing to justify sometimes. And I, I understand that. And then we do have our teachers who, who are resisting it. Um, in the name of saying that they're finding this work racist, um, that it's causing division, and that um, we're just causing more more issues. Okay, uh, I, I do want to open up uh, the discussion now to, to, to questions from uh, those of you who are watching uh, this town hall and participating. Now is the time for you to participate uh, in in the town hall. I'll remind you that you can put your questions on. Facebook, if you're watching that way, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, uh, you can also go to the little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, uh, press that and, and type questions in there. Uh, I, I'm gonna throw the questions out to all four panelists and, and anybody can, can answer, but I will probably direct them uh, to, to, to one or two people, at least uh, to, to begin with. Um, we've gotten a bunch of questions, I think uh, it's fair to say about about the narrative here and who controls that narrative and why. Of course, Fox News is talking about critical race theory all the time and framing what it is and is not for its, its viewers who may not be watching other uh, news programs or, or news channels. Um, and George uh, in the chat says, you know, unfortunately the people who are kind of buying into this part of the culture war don't really care about the truth. So he says an important part of the discussion should be about how that political arrow can be disarmed, but with the understanding that truth alone will not be effective against these assaults. All of these questions really ask, I think, what are we to do to try to reframe the conversation so that more people uh, feel like it's something they actually are open to, maybe want to do, or at least experiment with, and don't feel like uh, it's an attack on them. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Hudson, and then anyone else who wants to, to chime in, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you as well. But go ahead, Dr. Hudson. Uh, Brother Henderson, um, I'm in a, a, a very unique position right now, because uh, I wear a lot of hats. And I think that there are many ways to attack the issue. But if we're going to attack it, we have to attack it through an asset-based perspective and lifting up the assets of all people that are engaged in the conversation, one. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the asset framing perspective, that also puts us in a position to understand the psychosocial ways in which we engage with each other and how do we use social media to kind of like not counter the narrative, but tell another narrative that's supportive of the direction that we want to move forward with. 
and going back to the common core standards in education, they're there in social studies and history. They are there. And the goal of common core standards are to investigate people, places, and events. It's not about race, class, gender, gender identity, or all those other things. But those things come into it when you start to unpack the issues that are germane to legislation. So it's, it's a simple process of changing the curriculum, but we have to have the political will in the schools and the political wills in the community to say, you know what, we're going to take some time to revisit our educational, uh, re revisit our curricula to make sure that we are embedding critical discourse, conversations where students are actually doing investigations what they're already doing anyway. They're on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, and all these things collecting data on things that many times we are afraid to talk about. And they're willing to talk about those issues, but they just need some guided discussions. And if we take the approach that they use in law school, per se, a Socratic experience, a Socratic experience is just constantly asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, and building and building and building and building. But we as educators have to be willing and open to the new knowledge that's going to come from it. We want to get stuck in that beautiful box that's above your head behind you, Stephen. That's a, that's a beautiful box, but we're stuck in a box. And we're not realizing that education is like the universe. And once we open it up, that 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 broadens the conversation. So even if we just took away the, the, the words critical race theory and we still investigated the laws and how the laws impacted the people, the places and the events that occurred in the historical time frame, we're going to be looking at everything and everybody to see, again, going back to the earlier part of the discussion. Poor white men were not able to vote in these America. Poor white men coming from Europe were indentured servants. Not to, not to, not to say that what occurred with slavery is not, not something that we shouldn't be talking about, but let's talk about all of what occurred in America to lead us to where we are today and where we can potentially go tomorrow to heal from all of the atrocities of our past because a lot of people have benefited from those things. And that's kind of like where we, I think, just changing the curriculum and taking time to do it. We've, we've not done that. We're still, we're still teaching the way we were teaching pre-pandemic. Uh, Dr. Ray, um, uh, there are a bunch of questions about the legislative experts in a lot of states to try to deal with uh, critical race theory, which aren't really about critical race theory. I think they are about race consciousness and curriculum. Um, and a lot of questions about, again, how do, you, how do you fight that? How do you push back against that um, when, the, when the power behind it is misinformation? It is uh, an effort to deceive about what critical race theory is and whether it's even in the curriculum in the first place. Yeah, I mean, part, part of dealing with what we call um, a competing curriculum, because when it comes to social media, that's how it operates. It's a gift and a curse. There are many uh, what we call amateur communicators. It doesn't mean that they can't communicate well. That's not the point. But oftentimes, that's what happens is the people who can, who can convey the information the best, the ones who seem the savviest are the ones that people listen to. Um, so the truth isn't necessarily what it actually is. It's what people can convince others that it is. And that's part of what's happening right now with uh, critical race theory and narratives around it. So I, look, I, I, think, I think it's four things that we could think about. Uh, to paraphrase my favorite uh, musical artist, Prince, conversations matter like Black Lives and Books. So the first thing we can have is conversations. And I know uh, Mayor Jane talked about that, about the importance of having conversations with people who have different views than they do. That's the first thing. And accordingly, that's really important because this is why. I tend to think that everyone living on the planet loves someone or someone loves them. In that regard, if you simply have a conversation with the people you care most about and vice versa, we will have covered everyone on the planet. What that means is for most of us, we are looking forward to the holidays this year, finally being able to, in some ways, spend more quality time with our family and close friends. Who's better to convince others about their views? It's probably the people who care most about them. And of course, I get the, the power dynamics, a parent and a, a daughter, you know, an uncle and a nephew, those sort of things. But overall, that's important. And this is why. 
for those of us trying to find the courage, the wherewithal, the words to speak up and speak out, if you can do it with the people you care most about, your parents, your siblings, your closest friends, then guess what? You can probably do it with anybody. So that's the whole point is that first, those conversations matter. They oftentimes start with us taking information that we know, taking it to the people that we need to, to, to know it. Second, we have to rebuild trust in science by elevating academic research and writings. Now, I'm an academic, but I also am a senior fellow at Brookings. And one of the things that we really try to do is to elevate academic research. So even beyond reading an op-ed, say that someone writes, or, or even that I write, um, we wanna look at the actual documents and the actual writings and use that information by which to talk to people. And say, and, and look, one simple way I do it with my friends who have polarizing views for me, I will send them something in a text and I'll say, what do you think about this? I let them read it. When, when they want to search truth, they're, they're good people. They're trying to figure it out. Comparatively, what I don't say is what I used to say like a decade ago. I would say, hey, you need to read this. Those are two very different approaches. I simply say, what do you think about this? And then I notice that over time, they start saying things that are more in line with what they actually read because they value the person who sent it to them and I didn't push it on them. They read it for themselves. Third thing is, and this, this goes in line with this second point as well, we have to help people identify truth spots in the media. There is a media bias chart that people could search. You can go on any search engine on your phone or your computer, put in media bias chart, hit images, it'll pop up. And what it will show is the, the polarizing ways that media outlets operate. And what I tell people is that you want to search out uh, sources in the green box or somewhere close to the green box, AP, Reuters, Bloomberg. I mean, there, there are a few others that are there and say that is where you get more objective information about what happened. The more you get from that bell curve, all of a sudden, the more biased it is because you're listening to other people's views and not what actually happened. The final thing for people who want to become what I call uh, racial equity advocates and brokers, because that's part of what we're talking about. In, in this conversation, we're helping people to become what I call racial equity learners. When you start engaging with other people, you become a racial equity advocate. If we want to advance even far farther and become what I call a racial equity broker, you can actually start contacting your state legislatures, telling them what you think. See, this is the thing. We see people at these protests. Oftentimes, it's not as many people as we think as some of these you know, anti-CRT protest. But what's happening is state legislatures need to hear from you. So of all the people who are here watching this, you can draft a, a simple email, uh, a simple message. You can, you can send the text, you can upload um, a statement on your legislators webpage and tell them what you think about why the policies that they're trying to advance around critical race theory are not the types of things that you actually want to see in your community. And, and I just want to make this final point. In the analysis that Ale Alexandra Gibbons and I did looking at states, and we continuously update this, I'll, I'll put this in the chat in a little bit. But what we found is that uh, again, basically none of the bills explicitly mention critical race theory. And instead the legislations mostly ban discussions, trainings, um, orientations that the US, so, so any mentioning that the US is supposedly inherently racist, any discussions of conscious and unconscious bias, which we know is important, privilege, which we know plays out in many ways, dis discrimination and oppression. I mean, there are so many different ways that we see this playing out that is problematic for the way that our kids are going to turn out. And I think here's the, here's the big pitch to people who, who have heard a narrative that is different from what we know about critical race theory. It's to say, look, if you truly want America to be racially equitable, then actually looking deeply into the history of our country to ensure that we don't repeat the past is what we should all agree to commit to. And we only do that by educating our children about what happened in the past so that they can be better prepared to create an equitable future. Great answers from both the Dr. Hudson and Dr. Ray there to those questions. Um, so, so I wanna move to some other questions about schools, specifically about schools. Uh, Andrew in the chat says, uh, there's a difference between teaching CRT and curriculum that is informed by the principles and ethics of CRT as applied to the humanities. 
Across the country, there are examples of schools that are shaming students by labeling them oppressors because they're white and students of color victims because they are BIPOC. YouTube is replete with parents of all races speaking out against this at board meetings. How do you respond to this? Uh, uh, Mary Jane, the evening, uh, uh, address that, uh, address those claims even. Are you seeing anything like that in Grand Haven? There's nothing like that in Grand Haven. That, are we human? Yes. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely, particularly because we don't have a lot of practice talking about race, but to call somebody uh, an oppressor or a victim intentionally is not part of our thinking or our vocabulary. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that that's happening somewhere else because educators care so deeply about children and nationwide, our teenagers are experiencing suicide contagion in some places and we're trying to recover from that. Um, we intensely want them to feel like they belong. So there's also a question about the school board there in Grand Haven and what they're doing. I wonder if you or Haley Beatty Bart can address what you've heard even from the school board. Thankfully, we have a very supportive school board. Um, I think they do a great job of allowing our, our families to be heard. Uh, there's a public comment section at every meeting. And that's actually something I wanna slightly digress from your question to kind of go back to the other one um, and then we'll come around to it. Um, one thing that I think is really important to kind of add to what Dr. Ray was saying is we need to make sure that people who are feeling the way that I'm assuming many people who have tuned into this feel that we need to have um, education surrounding diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, that we need to be showing up and speaking in those spaces as well. Like your school board is one of your, at least for your, ch for your children. And again, the children are the future and they are like what our community is going to grow into. That's where a lot of change needs to start. It's one of the best elected positions that you can have the most connection with. So take advantage of that. Uh, we had a school board meeting last night. I went for the purpose of gathering some data for tonight's meeting. And uh, we there were five public comment speakers. Of those five, four of them addressed CRT. Um, the one that did not was actually our principal who came to give a small report on what was going on in our school. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. So if you were to just drop in, be a fly on the wall at one of those meetings, and if you felt like who was in that audience and what was said represented our community, you would go away thinking that the majority of our community is against the teaching of truth in schools and that they are um, against our efforts to help all students of all races feel included in our curriculum. So I think it's really important that we need to be those voices. I know someone had mentioned in the chat, and I want to elevate this as well, um, a long talk, which um, Kyle Williams is one of the founders of that. And one thing that I know I've learned from Kyle is that we need to be vocal um, in other spaces. So you know, we can all be keyboard warriors on Facebook and on Instagram and other social media, but your school board meeting is a great opportunity for you to come and voice those opinions. And they, in our community, they will be heard. So to go back to the question about our school board's response, our school board has been incredibly um, supportive, thankfully. There are some members of our school board who are questioning this work, um, but thankfully they are willing to have conversations with us and they are willing to grow. And I, I think want that growth and they want to learn why we find this so valuable. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I know, however, based on what I have learned from other places that that's not always the case everywhere. So I'm sure that there are people who are tuning in and tuning in and listening, and that might not be the experience in your community. So I want to empower you to be that voice, to step in and let your school board know where you stand and what you want to see in education and not just let this anti-CRT rhetoric be what's driving the conversation. Um, so th there's a great question in the Q&A about uh, books, articles, and other resources that our panel would recommend to people uh, to pick up and, and try to get through to, to try to understand 
someone's better. I think that's a wonderful question. It's one of my favorites uh, that, that we get at, at, at things like this. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Mary Jane Evink, specifically because you talked about uh, learning about CRT eight months ago. I'd love to know where you learned about it, um, but, but also what journey you've been on since then, reading and thinking about this uh, this subject, uh, bringing it to your your colleagues, I would imagine that you have a number of other things uh, that you might that you might have uh, encountered along that way. Boy, I'm afraid I might not answer your question to your satisfaction, but I'll give it a shot. Um, I'm going to go back to when Dr. Sean Harper was here in 2015. He said you need to talk about race, and so I bought like five books about talking about race. And I read them and as it turns out, you can't just read a book and then go into a classroom and start talking about race. You have to prepare your community and your support systems around that. Um, you know, there, there are so many good books and documentaries that give you the background to start having the conversations. So rather than reading a book about how to talk about race, although I really do like Singleton's Courageous Conversations about race, um, you know, watching the, the documentary about the 13th Amendment or, or other types of historical situations that give you the opportunity to have discussion is where we need to go. And I really liked Dr. Ray's suggestion about asking questions. What do you think about this? I think it's such a healthy approach. Um, one that can bring people of two sides of an opinion together to have a civil conversation because civil discourse is where we wanna go. That's, that, that's where it's at. So not, not a whole list of titles, but hey, um, things to talk about. I asked because I, I, I felt like you would give a really honest and, and experiential answer, right? This is what you've done. This is what uh, you've been, been working on. So I think that's, that's helpful regardless. Um, uh, I, next, I'll go to Dr. Ray. Um, Talk about things that you would recommend people do, uh, just you know, as a primer, even uh, to the idea of, of this approach to things. In terms of what things that people should access, in terms of to kind of educate themselves. Um, you, you know, look, I'm I'm a pretty traditionalist when it comes to a lot of things because because I'm an academic. So for me, uh, I mean, it goes back. One, one key question that I always ask people. I guess, I guess this will answer the question for me. There's so much that people could read on this topic. Um, I mean, beyond some, some of the things that, that my colleagues and I have written, I think that those are really good because they take some of the original text and they help people to be able to make sense of them. Accordingly, I think some of the original text are really important, particularly for educators and parents. Anyone who is going to be sharing knowledge and teaching and trying to describe it to someone else needs to know fundamentally where it comes from, that it came out of critical legal studies as a way to expand beyond the overly simplistic way that our criminal justice system operates. Uh, for example, the current cases of Kyle Rittenhouse, of the McMichaels, of, you know, for, for killing Ahmaud Arbery, those cases are not in a vacuum, but our court system would suggest that they are. Critical race theory says, look, we have to put this in a broader context to understand how the jury composition got to the way that it did, to, to highlight the way that the lawyer is trying to not just send dog whistles, but to literally send a loud bullhorn to people in that Southern County in Georgia. I, I grew up in Atlanta, I know, I know that area very well. And, and part of thinking about that context then is you have to go to the original text Part of what that means going to the original text, here goes another question I ask people, because I like asking people questions. It instantly tells me where to start. Do I start at eight or do I start at two? And oftentimes we just instantly start talking, assuming that people are at eight and they're still at two. And, and the problem isn't always the information you're conveying, it's that you made them feel uh, less adequate. And, and so part of that is if, if you want people to really learn, you have to oftentimes meet them where they are. And everyone on here knows that because we're educators. But for people who aren't, that is, a, that is a skill you have to try to build up. Accordingly, I ask people when they say critical race theory is this or that, you know, and I'm right by Virginia in DC. So, you know, we had a big 
governor's race that was highly based on some of this rhetoric that we're talking about. And I would say, have you read, a, uh, have you read like a, an academic article on critical race theory? I, I ask it very generally. Oftentimes I know the answer is gonna be no. And then they say no and I say, oh, well, you know, I've read a few. I'm curious what you would think about it once you read that original text. And then typically there's a pause and that pause is typically because they don't know how to access it because that's one of the one of the things that frustrates me about academic work is nobody can get it. That's part of the main problem, which is why people are looking at things on social media and other things because they can't get access to what they should be reading. So I say, how about I send you an article and then we can have a conversation about it afterwards. I disarm them. I, even though I'm going to send them a long text, I don't assume that they might understand every word, words that even sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Let me look it up. But I got a PhD. I feel OK with looking up words. A lot of people don't. So, so you, the, my point is a lot of people have a lot of baggage that they're bringing emotionally to these conversations. And part of what I try to do is back up, give them space, give them room to grow. Because, see, when we're trying to educate people, what are we trying to do? Oftentimes what we try to do is we try to grow a tree. We try to plant a tree, grow it. It has fruit. We want the leaves to fall off in the fall and turn beautiful. You don't have time for that. Your job in a short interaction is to plant a seed. Learn how to plant seeds. My seed to them is I'm going to give you access to an academic article that's one of the original texts of critical race theory by Kimberly Crenshaw, by Derek Bill, by Delgado, by these scholars who you might have heard their names, but have you read anything they've written? I'm going to give you access to that. Hey, I'm going to follow up with you in a couple of weeks. Let's have a conversation about it. So, sorry, that was my long answer of saying the, the most original text are the ones that I think are really, really important. And then once they get that, then we can really start learning. And then I can give them some of Kim Kimberly Crenshaw's intersex intersectionality work that really levels it up beyond how we simplistically might think about race. But I think the original text are some of the best things to do. Yeah, great answer. Um, so Haley, Baby Barton, I'm gonna come to you next. And for you, I'm curious, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're a teacher, you're interacting with other teachers uh, in, in a district where this is an issue. Let's say somebody comes to you and says, uh, I don't understand this, or I don't like this. Um, I don't want you doing this uh, in, in a classroom with uh, my children. What's, what's the, the thing that you would point them to, uh, to read or to watch, um, to educate themselves? So, it would depend on whether it's a parent or a student. And, and again, kind of like Dr. Ray was saying, like figuring out where they are and kind of what space they're approaching it from. I've noticed in the chat, there were some people asking about um, faith-based resources and things like that. Um, my faith is a huge part of what drives my work in social justice. Um, I believe that, you know, Jesus was one of the original radical people who was out there doing the work for the people. And that's um, who I want to emulate. So one of my favorite texts to recommend to someone who's maybe coming to it from that, that current conservative Christian space is to read Austin Channing Brown's I'm Still Here, um, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. I also, it's an excellent it's an excellent book because she tells, she builds a lot of empathy because she brings you into her life. Um, it's part memoir and then talks about her work in, in church spaces. So I'm finding that since that's a lens that a lot of people are coming from, that's an excellent text to, to hand to someone in, in that case. Um, and other places where I have people who are maybe just saying like, I'm not comfortable with this. I, I like recommending them to following um, Rachel Cargill and some of her work, uh, The Great Unlearn is a great resource for, for people. And I think it's, a, it's an inviting but challenging space because I think it's important for us to challenge ourselves. Uh, but I, I'm a big proponent of, of giving her as another, another resource out to people. So, and a lot of like building empathy is just so important because I think once we can get down to stories and help understand each other better, like then we can see what that's like. That's one of the biggest things I see in my classroom is when, when kids can start to talk and learn a little bit more about each other. Um, one thing about Grand Haven in particular is yes, we do have a very small BIPOC population, um, but we also have huge disparities in wealth. 
and we have kids living in mansions along the lakeshore, but we have several large trailer parks within our community as well. So there's, there's incredible poverty as well. And so sometimes kids just don't even have a concept of the fact that like, oh my gosh, I got my car taken away from me. I'm grounded. Well, the kids sitting next to them is like, I haven't gotten to have dinner for the last three nights because we don't have that. So I think when we can share more stories and learn that way, that's important. So I really like pointing people to, to resources like that, where they can learn more about real people and we can build, build that humanity. Cause that's where so much of this gets lost is when we just look at this, these people, not as people, but as, I don't even know, some like abstract figure that represents this idea of them, but forgetting that that person behind every person are other people who love them, things that they care about, interests that they have. And that's a great way for us to connect. So, so those are just two um, that come right off the bat. Uh, a couple others that I really like is I love Layla Afsad's um, White Supremacy and Me because it's broken down um, into like day by day um, chunks. It's a, tw it's supposed to be like a 28 day course. It originated as something she did as a blog. And I think that's a great resource for people to do as well, especially if you have other people that you're in community with that you can maybe work through it together and discuss. And she comes right out and tells you it's going to be hard, but that might not be one that I might not recommend to someone down at the two, but somewhere I'm getting a little bit higher up in there. It's, it's a great way to do it, especially again, if you have, um, people who are willing to, to work with you. I also love finding where people's passions are. I promise this will be the last one. You asked me a terrible question because I love books and I will could go on and on and on and on about this. But um, for, for my fellow teachers, one lens um, that I really like, and I'm actually about to lead a book study on this, is um, I love finding ways that we can include diverse perspectives, but with the focal point still being the kids and the teaching. So I'm going to be doing a book study um, with um, Goldie Muhammad's um, cultivating genius. And it's all about finding ways in our curriculum that instead of focusing on the oppression and the ways that um, people of color have suffered, like let's find the, the exciting and joyful things. Like black people were not just slaves. Like they did, um, they do have done and do amazing things. So let's look at that in our curriculum. Let's embed that in our curriculum. People from like uh, the, Air, uh, let's just say like Arab people, um, they are so many, there's so many bad stereotypes out there about the Middle East, but let's look at the amazing artwork that comes from there. Let's look at like our, the original, the origination of our number system. Like there's so many cool things about these different groups and, and white people did not create everything. So let's find ways that we can teach kids about that. So I love using a book like that, like, hey, let's focus on the curriculum because that might be a safe place and you can embed that. And that might be a way to help grow people's capacity with that. So I promise I will stop there again. And I am a huge book nerd. I could go on and on, but um, I'm so glad you let me answer that question. No, I'm, I'm glad we did too. Um, okay, uh, finally, Dr. Dr. Hudson. Wow, it, it's funny that I bring up the rear, and as I bring up the rear, uh, I want to take us back to a seminal text. Um, the Miseducation of the Negro by uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, which uh, to me is uh, um, foundational to this conversation around race in America, uh, and also The Souls of Black Folk uh, by uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, I think those books actually give a, a context upon which we can explore critical race theory through a different lens and see how people live their lives through an ethnographic perspective. And then Moving from those books, I would uh, offer um, other people's children, uh, other people's children by uh, Lisa Delpit, because she actually shows us going back to uh, what uh, was posted in the thread by uh, Anne Heath in regards to in locus parentis. Uh, we're there as educators and, and, and in place of the parents. We're there to support the young people. So we look at them through the lens of being there to work with them through the lens of their parents, then we're there to care for them like we would care for our own children. And going back to caring, uh, I would build uh, my framework around Nell Nodding's research on caring, because caring is so important when you, when you look at how you work with young people, as well as how we work with each other. And going back to this asset framing perspective, and uh, I think Mr. Furman or Pastor Furman had posted a question um, in a Q&A around what can the faith community do uh, in this predominantly white church in West Michigan. I think 
if if the faith community in this in the particular if your community is grounded in christianity then christianity in my research is grounded in love because when jesus was asked about what is the greatest commandment he said love so if we love each other then that moves us away from all of this deficit framework and i don't see uh steven henderson as the boogeyman i see steven henderson as someone who i care about who can care about me and we can build from that that position and then i think the um another question that came up uh in regards to in, on the thread, which takes me to a book or to uh, how do I work with uh, graduate students or undergraduate students to unpack these type of conversations? We actually look at uh, this video on the single narrative by Ch Sister Adichie. So people can hear it from an African perspective because oftentimes we just get so caught up on where we are from this Western uh, framework at, in America that we don't hear how other people are viewed uh, when they have this single narrative that's tied to them. And when we move from that space this summer, I had an opportunity to work with 900 Fulbright grantees from around the world talking about race in America. And they came up with phenomenal solutions for how we can address race in America. So I think the, the, the other thing is to extend this beyond where we are and invite other people to the table. So building on what we've all been saying in regards to building conversation, I think the conversation has to go broader than where we are and we need to leverage social media to get there. And then the uh, last book that I'll, 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 I'll suggest is Think Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman because in Think Fast and Slow, Kahneman, who, who's, a, who's a social psychologist, actually received the Nobel Prize in, in economics. And in his book, he lays out, the, lays out the argument that we are primed to think a certain way. So the way in which we think is the way in which we operate with people. So the way in which we're trained at home, the way we're in which we're trained in our community to think about people, that's the way in which we socialize and connect with them. So if we want to move away from those things, we need to retool ourselves and equip ourselves with this asset frame perspective that Haley suggested in looking at what Dr. Woodson uh, purported in all of the research that he was attempting to move forward with by showing black people in, in a favorable light. We have all of this defi deficit narrative around people of color, people in the LGBTQ community, women in general, around what they can't do. Uh, but I love those commercials about what girls can do because I have two young ladies who are my daughters and they can do anything. <laughs> That's excellent. That's a great point to, uh, to end our conversation on. Unfortunately, we do have to end. I think we could probably go on for hours and hours here. And, and certainly we're getting enough questions to, to keep fueling the conversation. But it is 8 o'clock, and we did say uh, we would end around then. I want to first thank uh, our panelists, uh, Dr. Truman Hudson, Jr., Marianne Evans, Dr. Rayshawn Ray, and Haley Beattie Barton for being here. You guys were absolutely wonderful. Uh, in, in helping to guide us through this discussion. So thank you uh, for being here. Thanks, of course, to all of the people who, uh, who attended this virtual town hall. We had about 400 people the whole time. I think that there, right there speaks to the power of this issue and, and of course, the power of the organizations who put this on, New Detroit uh, and Alita, uh, thanks to them as well for uh, seeing the light and, and shining it brightly for the rest of us to follow. Um, uh, thanks again for attending this town hall. If you are interested in some of the texts that uh, some of our panelists mentioned or other texts that, um, that participants have been dropping into the chat and the q and I think this is going to be available for some time. You'll be able to to look there and, and click on things or, or copy them. And, then, and I would imagine that on the Facebook Live, there are things there as well. Uh, take care of yourselves. And again, thanks very much for attending.